reading mm, uh, the New York Times or any other publication that you normally do on, on what's happening in our nation around us in this presidential election and, and, and all of the characteristics that we begin to see uh, about leadership and, 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 and the people who are going to lead the free world, if you will, in, in, in the next year or so. so um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this uh, morning, and so without further ado, <coughs> let me pass this on to Ellen, Thanks, so she can introduce our speaker. Thank you. Welcome all at this early hour. I appreciate your coming. And I'd like to start by thanking Jane Staunton from um, BNY Mellon Wealth Management and uh, the friends uh, whose generous support makes these programs possible. Our guest this morning was introduced to me by my husband, Pierre, so I do want to thank him. <laughs> and, uh, and I will remind all of you that it's your suggestions and ideas that bring these wonderful programs and people to, uh, to the college. So I encourage you uh, to think about it and reach out to me. Dr. Michael O'Malley is a noted compensation and human resource consultant, and he is CEO of Promontory Human Capital Solutions. He's also a best-selling author of Are You Paid What You're Worth, Creating Commitment, Leading with Kindness, and numerous articles for professional journals. And in his spare time, he keeps bees in his backyard. Why is it not surprising when a leader in his profession decides to take up a hobby, one that will provide quality time with his son, that he not only carves out the time, achieving his personal goal, but then multiplies the rewards by creating a self-best-selling book. The Wisdom of Bees, What the Hive Can Teach Business About Leadership, Efficiency, and Growth. It's most impressive and quite frankly a little intimidating. <laughs> but before Dr. Malley shares some, of, some, if not all, of the 25 lessons he learned from observing the bees, I want to point out that lesson 22, do good by doing well, is one we're experiencing here today. <coughs> Certainly an A-plus goes to our sponsor, BNY Mellon, for their vital support of our academic institution. And I'd like to give high marks to Concordia as well for its stated mission, service to community. <coughs> our collective efforts are part of the sustainable symbiotic relationship Dr. O'Malley presents in his book. But now with better explanation and more insight, I present Dr. O'Malley. Well, I don't remember um, ever giving a talk this early. Well, I don't remember giving up this early. Right. I, know, I know the objective, if you give a nighttime talk, is to keep uh, people awake. I guess my objective is to keep you from falling back to sleep at this, at this hour. Uh, this book was, you know, when I usually write books, you know, you, ha you have an idea, you know, there's a concept, you research it, you write it. But this one evolved over a long time period of time and really was a, the result of a convergence of just happenstance and circumstances. One being that my wife is allergic to most furry critters, so all of our pets growing up have been reptiles and amphibians, and uh, I will give you, I, you know, I think one piece of very important advice, don't get a water turtle. Do not get a water turtle very difficult to care for those little critters. And we had, you know, snakes, which of course, is, when they say put the lid on tightly, you really should put the lid on tightly. <laughs> uh, we had a snake, a ball python escape into our house, which, uh, you know, we called all the experts. They said, no, no, a ball python can't, can't exist uh, for six months during the winter. And my mother-in-law comes to town <laughs> and finds it alive in her in the guest room closet. She was really excited that she found it for us. <laughs> so and then I have an eccentric brother-in-law who came to town and he had just put 40 beehives in and he had said, you know, every kid should have a, a beehive in their backyard and you can take the male drones and you can bring them to school and he'll be a superstar and so you really should have a beehive. And so the superstar component convinced he and I that, you know, we should get this beehive. So we put a beehive, you know, this is now about 12 years ago in our backyard. And then I put a bench by the, uh, the beehive and I would observe them. And as an organizational psychologist, I started, you know, at first it looks like a Jackson Pollock painting, you know, they're sort of flying all over the place. And then you think, well, there's got to be some order and method to this. Let me sort of explore what it is that they're doing and I realize, you know, they do all the things that we do. They, you know, provide shelter, they care for their young and uh, they eat, they sleep, they work. 
Uh, and so the working hypothesis for me became that they're trying to solve the very same kinds of problems that we're trying to solve, and that's, you know, how do you productively and harmoniously work effectively as a large group? And bees are large groups, so there could be up to 50,000 bees per hive. Um, and, and so in the work, words of uh, Sherlock Holmes, I thought, you know, there may be something to the these, the little workings of gangs, as he called it. Sherlock Holmes was a beekeeper. He retires to Sussex Downs to write his magnus opus on bee culture, and he's called back into duty to uh, solve a crime, and Watson is very suspicious about his abilities, and Sherlock Holmes weighs him off and says, no, I've seen more incidents in my backyard in the hive than I have seen in all my years in London streets. And so, uh, so perhaps the bees do have something to say about things, about how we should organize. They've been around, they actually evolved from wasps, they've been around for over 100 million years, so they are quite successful species. They're not native to North America, they were brought here in the 1600s, and they, are not, and they now qualify as an invasive species. They are very successful wherever they are put. Um, one of the things that I, I get when I write blogs or articles, though, is that, you know, comparing humans to bees is an unfair comparison. I mean, we're not, we're different, right? I mean, they, uh, and usually what, they, what they're getting at are one of two things. One is that bees are pre-programmed, and so, you know, they just do things quite naturally, whereas, you know, we are sort of encumbered with decisions and so forth. And I have to say that part of it is untrue. And whether or not you call it thinking or not, you know, that, that's debatable. But they're certainly a lot smarter than you, they, you think that they might be. They can count up to four. They can, uh, they can recognize things like faces and landmarks. They can uh, recall, they can, you, after a millisecond exposure to a single color, 24 hours later, they can identify that color. They've got wonderful working memory. If they had cell phones, they could fly and talk at the same time. Uh, they can visit 10,000 flowers in a day and report a single you know, place of interest to their sisters and half-sisters that, that very same day. They're tremendously productive. Uh, creatures. They, a hive, uh, a typical hive will produce 200 to 300 pounds of honey uh, per year. It takes 55,000 miles of flight and the visitation of about 2 million flowers to produce a single pound of honey. So they are, yeah, they're quite industrious, uh, hardworking uh, animals. So they can, and so they, they do make choices. Uh, they do have more intellectual abilities, you know, in a uh, hundred thousand neurons that they have or a million neurons that they have. Um, so that's, that's one thing. In order to adapt, you really have to be able to react to uh, your environment and make decisions, and bees certainly do that. The other, the other thing that I, that I get is probably a little closer to the truth in terms of differences that, that maybe give bees an unfair advantage. And one is that they have a common objective. That, the, the, you know, the, sort of the objective and the interest of the hive are those of the individual bees themselves and vice versa. They're all sort of one. You know, they all have the same uh, cause and purpose uh, and, uh, you know, it's to regenerate and, and to grow uh, and to survive. Uh, however, they do, uh, this collectivity does encounter, like us, it's not, that isn't completely true because they do have, there are circumstances when uh, individual bees are out for their individual interests and beehives do have a police force that sanction individuality. So if a bee acts in its own interest, which is usually to, to lay eggs, where only the queen has that privilege, there is a police force that actually stops that from occurring. So, uh, so they do levy sanctions against individualistic behavior in order to maintain uh, a collectivity. I, had a fr I have a friend who's um, 
writing a book, they're former actually naval officers, now management consultants, about what you can learn from, what managers can uh, learn from mutinies. And one of them had written, you know, <laughs> <laughs> right, uh, which is a good idea. And one of them wrote to me saying that they found in the Belgian Royal Archives a letter written by mutineers to the Spanish Netherlands with, the, uh, with a seal that said, mens atum omnibus on it. We are of one mind. And then it was a very ornate seal with a swarm of bees on it. Uh, so they do have, you know, they have a tendency to have, uh, they don't really have as much, oh, infighting, I would say, as the human communities experience. Uh, the other advantage uh, that they have that I think is truer, and that is that they, and I try very hard in the book not to anthropomorphize, but you know, we would call it the behavior we would observe, we would call trust, and that is if one bee tells another bee what to do, they don't sort of stare in disbelief or question it, and you know, they actually accept what is being told as, as genuine and truthful. So, for example, when a bee visits a particular flower patch and that flower patch is depleted, uh, the bee will check back for a few hours just to make sure conditions haven't changed before completely abandoning that patch. But later that same day, that same bee may see another bee advertising that very same patch. Well, the bee doesn't say, well, you know, I've been there and there, I know there's nothing there, as if to say, you know, we've tried that before and it doesn't work. What the bee does is he actually goes to look for herself. And it is herself since, as you know, most of the colony are female. It's just a very small portion of a colony that are made up of males. So um, even though they have certain advantages, this sort of this uh, collect, this sort of collective purpose and inter high interpersonal trust that that uh, reduces the transaction costs that many of us experience in our daily lives. It doesn't mean that we ought not strive for that. It suggests that these are necessary components of good organizational form. So um, there's a lot to, there's a lot. I have 25 lessons in the book, uh, which we're not, obviously can't get through in the time that we have. But I do want to talk about some of the more important lessons which has led to their, um, which has led to the bee survival for all of these years. And the, the five things I want to talk about is that they're very future oriented, uh, is number one. Uh, that they never um, interfere with the uh, hive's ability to perform over the long run. Uh, it is a meritocracy. Uh, they are very good at business continuity. And believe it or not, despite the queen and all of the sort of the publicity that she gets, it is a highly decentralized organization. So authority is uh, dispersed within the hive. So I'll talk about that, those five things. And that should take us to maybe about a quarter after eight, and then we can take questions. And there's a lot more to the hive than, than I got to get my water here, than that. So let's start with the, um, uh, a future orientation. Maurice Manderlink, the Nobel, Nobel laureate, once said that the god of the bee is the future. Uh, and that is very true. They are not short-term maximizers. Their philosophy is to maximize returns over a broad geographic area and prolonged extended time horizon. Uh, and that is most evidenced by the fact that they even though they will concentrate resources on the most lucrative flower patches, they always have a scouting force out looking for the next new thing because they don't want to put everyone in one place and have that depleted and then have a period of time where there's no intake of honey or pollen. And pollen is essential because they keep it in short supply, only about a three-day reserve. And that's what they use to feed the larvae, the young bees. And so they can really never go without the intake, particularly of pollen. And so they always have scouts looking for pollen and, and uh, honey and don't unduly concentrate all of their forces in one place. They could maximize their return at any particular given in point in time if they did, but that's not how they operate. They're always thinking ahead. Uh, and in fact, it's 
this, the number of scouts that they have is inverse to the environmental conditions. So the worse environmental conditions get, the more scouts they send out to look for pollen and honey. So if you conceive of this as sort of a, an R&D function in, in a company, it's like they never, first of all, they never cease uh, there's never a decline in their R&D capability and the worse things get they actually increase their R&D capability so and how many scouts that they send out in the world so they are very future oriented not present oriented the, the, the name of the game is to not maximize current returns but to maximize returns over a long period of time they're very happy with consistent incremental returns over a prolonged period of time so that's number one, they protect the future. Number two is that uh, uh, anything that interferes with, well, the, um, what they try to do is protect the longevity of the hive. They never try to impair the hive's ability, bee's ability to produce over the long run. So when a bee is born into the world, the idea is that the bee will live a long and productive life, which is, on average six weeks. Uh, it's the lifespan of a typical bee. Uh, not long. I, it's actually pretty, you know, amazing that they live so long with so much turnover uh, in the hive. But the way they, they go about it is that they, they measure net energy expenditure, not gross energy expenditure, and because what they're trying to do is preserve their wings. Their wings wear out and they want, they want the foragers in the field as long as possible without wearing out and being depleted. And so they're not indifferent to, um, to flowers that are nearer or further away from the, uh, the hive. They'll prefer the ones that are, that are closer. They'll prefer flowers that are more tightly clustered together. So the whole idea is to preserve, is to preserve, is to take in as much as possible, but preserve energy in doing that. Uh, when I was in London last, last year, I met with a guy called um, Nigel Rain, who had just completed an experiment called the Traveling Salesman Experiment. And the Traveling Salesman, if you're familiar, the Traveling Salesman Experiment is uh, you have houses set up, and, and the idea is for us, you know, uh, humans, to figure out the shortest uh, route between all of the houses, and, so, and then you can have nuances like without retracing your steps and so forth. Well, he set up um, uh, these, you know, plastic flowers with sugar in it, and, and he wanted to see how quickly it took bees to actually solve the traveling salesman program and uh, he had computer programs sort of competing against them and what he found is that bees solve the traveling salesman problem quicker than a computer can. So they actually can find the shortest route much faster than the computer can calculate the, the shortest route which is, uh, he said, you know, which is kind of interesting. He doesn't know how they do it, you know, but all he can show is that they can do it. So this is part of the energy preserving uh, part of the, um, of the hive. Uh, what's interesting is that there is a direct correlation between the average tenure of a hive and the productivity of a hive. So this net energy is important because you want bees to live to their full potential and product, you know, product, product, productive potential. Uh, and I think the reason is uh, the same reason that occurs to us. A couple of years ago, I did a study for a retail, uh, a well-known retailer, which you would all know, and I showed using a particular analysis that this particular retailer had to replace, uh, for every salesperson, they had to replace that person four times during the year because the turnover was so horrendous. So it took four people to keep a single position filled throughout the year. The consequence of that is that they loosen their recruitment strategy. So if you were breathing, you were, you know, <laughs> allowed in. Uh, they shorten the training cycles and put people on the sales floor. And then, of course, you know, this destructive downward cycle repeated itself, which they found very difficult to get out of. Well, bees are trying to avoid the same thing. They want 
if they if bees die prematurely in the field, then what they'll have to do is send more immature and less trained, and they do train one another, by the way. When a bee leaves the hive, it pairs up with a, a, a more experienced bee and follows it into the field so it learns how to manipulate flowers better, learns how to navigate. So there is a mentoring program in the hive. <laughs> Uh, but what would happen is that they have to send uh, immature bees out earlier into the world to, to forage. Uh, they will, um, uh, being immature, they will not survive as long. And so, you know, gradually uh, the number of foragers will dwindle and the hive will die. And so it's very critical for them to have longevity in the hive and, and that preserve the um, the ability of the hive to perform over the long run. Uh, the next thing is it's a meritocracy. You, uh, believe it or not, there's very little nepotism uh, in the hive. So um, what matters most is can you perform the job, basically. And there's a you know there's a, a, a minor sense of ruthlessness in this as you'll uh, as you'll see, but. So if larvae are infected and have no chance of succeeding um, in the hive, they will be thrown out of the hive. If a, um, a bee has mites or is diseased in some way, it will provide a shaking signal. It will ask for help to be cleansed, and other bees will try to help it. But if they can't, that bee also will be excluded from the hive. Uh, and there are undertakers in the hive, you know, that sort of get, uh, that's what they're called. Uh, they remove, uh, that's their job, is to remove uh, dead or dying bees from the hive to keep it clean. Uh, but probably the two best examples of a meritocracy uh, exist with drones and with the queen herself because she too has to produce. 2,000 eggs a day, basically, is what she has to produce. Uh, those are, it sounds like a lousy job. <laughs> uh, but uh, here's how it works. Um, drone, there's only a, less than 5% of the hive is made up of these larger male drones. They have big eyes. They're very powerful flighters, uh, flyers, so I don't want to undermine their capacities, but when a new queen uh, arrives at the hive, she goes up. Uh, there's this area in the air called congregation areas. It's kind of like a bar room in the air uh, where all the drones and the queen go to. And the drones start chasing the queen around. And she ends up uh, mating with oh, uh, anywhere from 12 to 15 uh, males. And she stores that sperm for her whole life. And this is very important if we have time to get to it because this is the way diversity is introduced into the beehive. The fact that they have multiple, the queen has multiple fathers. So these multiple patrilines is the way that they introduce diversity. The more diverse the hive, the more productive the hive. It has a more robust um, uh, worker population and it produces more honey. So diversity is critical uh, to the survival of the hive. Well. Uh, drones that are successful, if you want to call it that, in mating with the queen uh, die in an aerial freefall. They do not survive the mating process. Uh, those that are unsuccessful return to the hive and hang out. They don't have any, any other kinds of things that they do. They, uh, they basically go for leisurely flights uh, on sunny days, you know. Uh, however, and this is where it gets, uh, when fall comes and the bees need the honey uh, to live on, probably the, the saying might be, uh, if you want to eat the honey, you have to contribute to the hive. And the drones aren't contributing to the hive in the fall, and the hive can make new ones in the spring, and they do. So the drones become expendable in the fall. And they don't have stingers, whereas the females do. And it's a decidedly one-sided affair. Women, you may be 
pleased to hear this. There is a day called Massacre of the Drones, <laughs> where they are ceremoniously ushered out of the, uh, unwillingly out of the hive uh, for the winter. And so that, uh, so that the, the, the remaining female bees have the honey to, to live on. So because they're not producing, they become expendable and uh, are eliminated. So basically anything that doesn't contribute to the productivity of the hive has been selectively disfavored, and this is one of those things. Uh, the queen herself uh, is expendable. When the, um, the natural life of a queen is about, I mean, if you were just to let her go, it would be about seven years. But her productivity begins to wane after about two to two and a half years. And the worker sends really when there is a decline uh, in productivity. Uh, a, a, um, a hive cannot exist without a queen. And it is sort of imperiled if they wait too long to replace the queen. If she becomes too unproductive and they wait too long to replace the queen, the a uh, hive is in jeopardy because it takes about 30 days for, to produce a queen from the you know, inception to the time that she actually becomes a productive working member of the hive society, colony society. So it's very important to think ahead in terms of business continuity. And there are two ways in which queens can be replaced. So when workers sense that, uh, that the queen is, um, has a decrement in productivity, they actually start building what are known as queen cells. And these are larger, the queen is uh, the largest bee in the hive, and the, and the cells that the bees build are larger, and uh, the queen lays eggs in these particular cells, and there's usually about 12 of them that are created and if uh, in the hive uh, you are sort of what you eat, uh, you, so all fertilized eggs become females, but what distinguishes the queen from other females is that the, the queen is fed a special high protein diet called royal jelly, and that actually transforms her genetic makeup. The, the, the uh, bee's genetic makeup, and she actually transforms into the queen, of which there are going to be 12 of them. The first one out gets the job, basically. The first one to come out of the cell is the next queen. I mean, she's, ob she's obviously the most developed, most mature, and the reason she gets the job is because she quickly dispatches with her competition by stinging them through their uh, cell walls. Yeah, yeah, she eliminates the competition, basically. Uh, 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 either as they're emerging or right through the, uh, the wax cell walls. Queens have retractable, reusable stingers, and so it's, they, can, they can do the job efficiently. This new queen goes on a uh, one of these, you know, mating flights. The old queen is kept on uh, until the new queen returns and they see that she's productive. Uh, now, if the old queen is smart, uh, and beekeepers do see two queens in colonies, so it's not atypical. Uh, if the old queen is smart, uh, she will retire to some corner of the hive and live out her life in peace as sort of emeritus queen. Uh, if she gets in the way, she'll be killed, uh, basically. Not basically, she will be killed. Uh, <laughs> uh, so they're left with uh, one queen. But what's interesting about this is that the, sort of the old sort of ruler stays on for a period of time until it's known that the, the successor will in fact succeed in her role. And it's only then that, uh, that the old queen progressively steps further away. And this would be like maybe having co-CEOs for a period of time and then the CEO becoming the chairman of the board before they become emeritus and you know are, have really nothing left to do with the organizational uh, operations. 
So that's one way the queen is replaced. The other way the queen is replaced is um, if there's, is by the beekeeper, uh, him or herself. Uh, it comes, it's imposed from the outside. And you do that when there is something culturally wrong with the colony that cannot be fixed through the current bloodline. That is the only way to change the culture of the colony is to bring in new blood from the outside, basically change the genetic makeup of the, uh, of the colony. And the typical problems are over, overly aggressive bees, uh, or more typically a susceptibility to disease. And so in either case, the beekeeper um, would want to replace uh, the current lineage with a new bee. Now, if you take a new bee and put it in a hive, it is quickly killed uh, through a method called heat balling. So I want to warn you not to get heat balled. So it's very hard for a newcomer to enter an organization uh, and, and not get heat balled. The, actually, the bees, the worker bees will surround the bee and heat it to intolerable, intolerable temperatures and sort of suck the air out of it so it will suffocate. So, um, so you don't want to just plop somebody in and say, go at it. The way to actually get a bee to, um, what you want to do is give the workers and the queen time to get familiar with one another before you release the queen into the hive. And so the way beekeepers do it is by lowering a, uh, a cage. The queen is, in a, is encaged with a candy stopper on the end. So the workers can smell and sense and become familiar with the queen without actually having direct contact with the queen. And uh, the queen and the workers eat through the candy stopper and release her after a period of days, and then she's readily accepted. So there has to be this sort of period of adjustment where you get acquainted with one another before being released into the, into the uh, hive. Um, also, if you bring in, th this is with virgin queens, if you bring in a queen that's already impregnated, she's more likely to be accepted because it's like bringing uh, business with you. Or <laughs> it's like, uh, oh, all right, come on, come on in. You're, uh, yeah, so, uh, so those queens are more readily accepted if they know that she's going to be productive from the start. So they're more readily accepted as well. Uh, so that's, that's the, uh, the meritocracy part of it. Um, and the uh, business continuity. Now I want to talk about the whole idea of, of empowerment. And to some extent, most people think that this could be the more fascinating aspects of, uh, of hive life. And that is, most people think that the queen sort of regulates behaviors uh, in the hive, but she has very little to do with, um, with the extant behaviors of uh, the foraging force in particular. They're pretty much on their own. It's a highly decentralized organization. Um, the queen's job is to lay eggs. She makes her presence known, which is not unimportant because it actually um, uh, relieves, I guess, I, I don't know. Uh, when, when the queen is absent or when her absence is, uh, is felt, the um, the bees do get agitated. So it is, the queen's presence does in fact have a calming effect on, on the hive. So, I mean, she isn't superfluous in, in, that, in her effects, but, but most of the decisions are made by the bees that are closest to the information. And a perfect case of this is, occurs uh, with swarming. Now, in the hive, you know, you've heard too big to fail. Uh, in the hive, you get too big to succeed, and that they have fixed resources, and they, a hive reaches a point where it becomes inefficient, that creating more bees that won't have jobs and bringing in honey where there's nowhere to store is inefficient. And so what they do is a little less than half of the hive uh, leaves. Uh, departs the hive in a swarm, and this is how they sort of, in mass, become these 
invasive creatures because the swarm then goes off to look for another home. Now, they do give the swarm the best chance possible of success. It's less likely the swarm will succeed than the host organization, but they try their hardest to give the swarm uh, a, 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 you know, a fighting chance. So the, the swarm gets the old queen, a disproportionate amount of the younger bees, younger foragers, so that the new hive will have a longer period of time with productive bees. And, they give a, and they're given a, a little store of honey to bring with them. And maybe you've seen them, uh, these swarms. They're like, they look like you sort of loosely rounded soccer balls. And they attach themselves about 100 meters away from the, uh, from the original hive. And they're hanging from a tree and so forth. And what they do is they send out 200 or so of the most experienced Bees, that is, the foragers that are the oldest, go out and look for a new home. And uh, they have criteria that they use. You know, they're looking for homes that have a certain cavity size, size of opening, height from the ground, direction, and so forth. And they come back, the bees come back with about 24 options in which the swarm will sort of entertain as possibilities. And they will do this dance to try to get the other scouts that are uncommitted or haven't found anything to come visit their site and to place a vote. You know, what do you think? You know, uh, so they do this dance to try to entice uh, the bees to come. Now, they, the dance, and I, I don't want you to leave without understanding what the waggle dance is, because if anything, you should know what the waggle dance is. Uh, <laughs> which, you know, Von Frisch won the Nobel Prize for discovering. So uh, you, should, you should know what this remarkable communication signal does. Uh, the more excited they are about a particular place, the more circles they basically run. And those circles decline with each visit at a re relatively fixed rate. So bees that are more excited about a particular location, that their little circle running extinguishes slower than those that are less excited and become essentially free agents and reset themselves and then start looking for other places. Well, after a period of time, what happens is that there's a convergence of opinion on a single site. There's a, a quorum is reached and there's a piping sound that they let off and um, and the, where they're instructed to sort of start warming their uh, flight muscles and they, the swarm then takes off toward their new home. Uh, the direction, since most of these bees have not seen their new home, the direction that they actually head in is dictated by uh, something called, oh now I'm going to think of it, they're like shooter bees, but they actually shoot through the uh, swarm at high speeds in the direction of the new home home, so they follow that particular, uh, those particular shooter bees to the location. They've done experiments where they've messed that up, and, uh, you know, if you have bees going in different directions, and they can never find their home in that case, so a unified, consistent direction obviously is important to find, you know, reaching your sort of goal state in, in this case. So that's how it works. The way it the way it works, though, so well is um, uh, so all of these decisions are made without any central authority, queen control, et cetera. It's all made by the bees in the field themselves. And they have a couple of things that make this empowerment work exceptionally well. Uh, one is that they um, adhere to what might be called the collective wisdom uh, theorem by the Marquis de Condorcet. And, that is, and, and then that has two elements to it. In order to make good decisions, you need two, two components. One is that you need a broad sampling of options, which they do by sending out 200 scout bees and coming back with 24 viable alternatives. Um, the, the other is, what is the other one? Uh, 
I don't know why I've... Give me a second. Uh, bu -bu -bu -bu. Oh. It's to maintain a value of independence. I'm sorry. I just uh, That is, each B ha places its own vote uh, on connected to the others. And so when the advertisements are made, uh, each B gets to place its own vote independent of what any other B thinks or influences. So it's a wide variety of options coupled with independence of voting that actually makes the decisions that they make usually the right ones to make. Now they make these decisions with incomplete information because they're trying to make a trade-off between speed and accuracy. So one of the lessons is that you know they make good enough decisions using the collective wisdom theorem. That is, they don't act on, I mean they could go out and look for the perfect house somewhere, but they just don't have the luxury of that time. And so they collect as much information as possible within a reasonable amount of time and act on that information even though it's not 100% information. So, but they're reasonably assured that the deci decision will be good, a good decision simply because uh, they have you know, abided by good decision-making processes. Um, the other is that they have this great communication, uh, very simple communication um, <coughs> method that, and they actually have a very good knowledge uh, center within the hive. So for instance, uh, sort of the center of all information is in the hive on the comb. Now the comb actually has a little lip on it that the bees will flick. And basically it will send out a low frequency signal throughout the hive. It will travel further uh, where there are less clusters of bees. And so if bees are standing on the periphery, they will pick up these frequency signals. And basically what they're being told is, you know, you need to come over here if you want to find out what's going on. You're too far removed from sort of the messages that we're, sent, we're giving out. So come over here and get closer. This is where the knowledge center is. You're too far out. So they actually tell bees where to go to get the information. Uh, the other is this simple um, mechanism that they use to communicate. And the waggle dance is the most famous. They use it to find the home, uh, and they use it to find flower patches. And the way it works is that uh, in a, so the waggle dance communicates three things at the same time, direction, uh, quality, and distance in one dance. And Everything, the, the hive is set up on the vertical, so everything is on the vertical. In the hive, straight up on the comb represents the sun. So if, you know, uh, so straight up at the top, that's the sun. That represents the sun inside the hive. So if you can imagine, you know, that this floor is on an angle, and this is straight up, the bee will start a waggle dance at a particular angle to, the, to this, this uh, vertical line and cross it at a certain point. Now where it crosses, it creates an angle between the vertical and the cross. And that tells the bee, when you leave the hive, find the sun, go 60 degrees to the right. Uh, and, uh, and then it will, do, it will do a counterclockwise turn first, and then it will repeat the angle and then go back in a clockwise fashion. The number of rotations it makes will tell it how good the patch of flowers are or the house is that they have found. So, uh, so there's two things, right? The angle that you need to go on, the direction. When you get there, how good it's going to be. And then, the wa and then they actually waggle uh, in the middle. I won't do that. I'm not going to do the waggle. <laughs> uh, uh, they waggle in the middle. And the amount of waggle actually tells them 
how far to go. Now the distance is, it's actually distance weighted by difficulty. So for instance, on two separate days, um, I may have, you know, may have the same distance to travel, a B may have the same distance to travel. Maybe it's from here to this desk. Uh, however, on day, day one, it's calm. Day two, there's a, a very strong headwind. What the waggle will do on day two is, is communicate that you have further to go. The waggle will be longer because it actually incorporates distance with the fact that it's going to be tough going for you. And the same would go for if, you, if they have to go through trees and things like that. The, the waggle will be longer because it's going to be a more difficult run for them. So one dance communicates three things, direction, quality, and distance, which is amazing, I think. And that's only one of 17 communication signals that they have. They have plenty of others. And for that reason, they've been called honorary mammals because they have, you know, a very sophisticated communication system. But that's the other part. Not only do they make sound communication decisions, but they have good communications. They also have, you know, they also send their most experienced people out, you know, people, uh, foragers out to look for things. So what makes empowerment work in the hive or this decentralized authority is sound decision processes, uh, competent foragers, uh, and a really excellent communication. So you can't just say, oh, we're going to become an empowered organization and hope that it happens without having these other components in place that the, that the, that the bees have. So I know we have until 8.30, and there's a lot more to describe about the hive. They do tend to be a very risk-averse uh, group. I mean, they're really, they are designed to um, pre uh, prevent catastrophic failure of the hive. And so anything they do is really with the idea that we are going to protect ourselves against worst case scenarios. Uh, and that's how they operate. Uh, so things might will go bad because they can't predict the future either, you know, and so in environmental conditions. But no matter what happens, we want to actually make sure that we have assumed the least risk or have a contingency plan in place where we can deal with those risks. So, uh, so for instance, if they're short foragers, they have a set of precocious bees uh, that they can accelerate their development and get them into the field faster. These would be like high potentials or fast trackers in organizations. They can get them out much more quickly. So they do have these sorts of contingencies that they can initiate if conditions warrant. So, well, how about we take, you know, questions? Yes. I just wondered how you know how much uh, honey to take. That is to say, if you take too much, then the hive won't have enough for itself. And if you take too little, maybe it goes to waste or it starts a swarm or something. How, how do you know the amount that you can take? From well, um, you know, we're, we're not actually the professional beekeeper. We take about, I would say, we take about 25 pounds. We really take very little honey relative to it. I mean, we, you know, we. We jar maybe 50 to, you know, 100 jars full of honey, and we leave most of the honey to the, um, uh, to the, um, uh, to the bees. Uh, I don't think they would think that uh, there's ever, I mean, if you do take too much, they're not going to, they will not survive the winter. So, um, you know, I, I don't know what the uh, rule of thumb is. They probably... You know, I usually see these commercial people take about 100 pounds, about a third, about a third of the honey, and they seem to do fine existing through the winter. What happens in the cold weather? What, what is the hive activity when it gets um, freezing and cold? Um, well, this is a nice case of uh, diversity at work. Uh, the, the short answer to that is that they actually... Um, uh, are in a ball within the hive and they flap their wings or contract their muscles to heat and cool the hive to keep it at a relatively steady state of 93 degrees Fahrenheit 
inside the hive. Now, um, diversity comes in on this. If you, if you imagine this, they don't all flap their wings or contract their muscles at the same time. So let's just imagine, because they're sensitive to different temperature cues. Let's just assume now that you had a ship and all hands were on deck and all of the people on deck were the same. And, so, and that the ship started to tilt. So given the fact that all the people are the same, they all run to the other side of the ship at the same time and it starts tipping that direction and then they run back to the other side and, you know, and then the oscillations get larger and larger until the ship capsizes. Well, diversity is actually, in the hive, is actually designed to prevent these oscillations. So the more diverse the hive, the more sensitive to, they are to a wider range of environmental cues. And so if you had a, a, a non-diverse uh, group of bees, they would not be able to keep the temperature at 93 degrees, as well as having a diverse set of bees that are more sensitive to very subtle differences in temperature. So they turn on and off uh, at different times. So if the bees were on ship, only a few of the bees would go over to the other side. Uh, and then they would see what happens, and then maybe a few would come back and a few more would go over, and so they would try to keep it relatively stable. But the diversity also helps in the field because they'll more diverse um, uh, hives will travel further from the hive. They will go up to eight miles from the hive, by the way, to, to forage. Find their, and somehow find their way back. I don't think I could do that, you know, in an in a unfamiliar territory. Uh, and uh, they'll uh, forage from uh, different kinds of, you know, a wider array of flowers. So diversity is directly related to the productivity of the hive and the survival of the hive. But that's essentially what they do. They actually create a ball and, and keep it at 93 degrees. Yeah. Yes? But bees seem to be so different from ants. Do you have an ant here in your backyard? I saw little ants walking in a long line, and then ever so often there were big ants policing them. Oh, uh, interesting. I, I don't know much about ants. I mean, I, I think um, I got more interested in bees because they just seem smarter to me. <laughs> right. I, I know even the, uh, the way uh, the um, anthills are built is purely, it's like a Poisson distribution. It's purely random. Some ants gather uh, from further away and build it up. So it's basically, a no, you know, you're seeing a normal distribution being created by the ants. Uh, but um, I, just the fact that um, bees um, uh, have these uh, abilities, um, cognitive, some cognitive abilities. Uh, they're great. Somebody was asking me before. They actually have great uh, vision, color vision, as you might expect. But they actually have a wonderful sense of smell as well. And they actually can sniff out bombs better than dogs. So there are such things as sniffer bees out there. Uh, it's harder to get them back than dogs, however. <laughs> so that's, a, that's been a problem with this, because, with that. Uh, come here, boy. Come here, girl, rather. Uh, <laughs> but their olfaction is very, their smell is very, is very good. Um, uh, okay. Um, yes? Could you comment on what's going on in California? There seem to be obviously some viruses or something that are impacting the hives, and so they seem to have problems, and I think the farmers yes. have had some concerns about getting enough bees to be able to pollinate their crops. Yes, which is interesting because, you know, bees, um, well, we're going to, it's colony collapse disorder, or it's sometimes called the Marie Celeste disorder. Marie Celeste was a ship that was. Uh, from the 1870s that was lost and found and all the jewelry and everything was on the ship except people. And with colony collapse disorder, it looks like an operating hive except there are no bees present. So it looks like everything is in order except the bees aren't, aren't there. Um, just as background, bees actually are worth, the pollination's worth about $16 billion worth of agricultural revenue. 
uh, about three out of every four bites of food we take are related to the activities of bees. So they're really essential to uh, our diet and the, and the economy. Most bees, uh, there, aren't, there are fewer and fewer feral bees in the world. Uh, most of them are commercial bees, something like 90%. And they are shipped around uh, the country to pollinate these huge agricultural farms, whether they're agricultural uh, avocado farms and that sort of thing. Well, if you can imagine, you're shipping bees from place to place. They used to feed them on high fructose corn syrup, which is, you know, it's like drinking a Coke a day. Uh, and I mean, they're experimenting with more, um, oh, with, um, high protein substitutes, but what they're finding is that uh, in the wild, feeding on, they need different kinds of pollen and different kinds of proteins, and feeding them on one is insufficient. So they're traveling, so tell me if this sounds familiar. So they're working long hours. Foragers typically have to sleep eight hours a day, uh, and they're not. Uh, so they're not getting enough sleep, they have a poor diet, and they're working hard. <laughs> uh, and what happens, and I think part of the reason they haven't been able to pinpoint what the actual sort of proximal causes of colony collapse is that what happens is that their immune systems are, are uh, depleted and they're actually susceptible to more kinds of diseases of all kinds uh, because of this. And so that's why you know nobody has been emphatically been able to say it's due to this it's probably due to an immunity deficiency that's created by trucking the bees around feeding them poorly not giving them enough sleep and and this could even be during the winter months when uh, a lot of bees are really accustomed to getting more sleep so um, so colony collapse is probably you know a man-made phenomena due to the fact that we have these large agricultural farms that need to be pollinated. Yeah. What about the uh, uh, killer bee, uh, killer bees that you, you read about from time to time? Well, um, they're working their way north. I don't know. I mean, they're more aggressive. Um, other than that, I don't know much about that. Aggressiveness is usually measured by how protective a bee is of its hive. So, um, you know, one year we had a hive where if you walked into the backyard, you got stung. I mean, so they, so their sort of their territorial range was quite wide, and that's true of the killer bees. Their territory is defined; they define it as a, a quite large territory. And if you venture into that, you'll be attacked. So that's kind of the that's the pre predominant difference. Speaking of other types of bees, well, what is a bumblebee? How does that relate to it? Uh, well, um, first of all, I, I will say that the bees that, that you're familiar with in the backyard are Apis mellifera bees. It's the honey-bearing bee, which is a, it, it was misnamed, but once you name a, a species, you, you can't take it back. Uh, they don't carry honey, they carry nectar which is transformed into honey. It, there's a special stomach that the honey is carried, uh, nectar is carried in. It's transferred to other bees who then put, it's mixed in with enzymes and then stored in the comb. So basically, and then they flap their wings to eliminate uh, the water. So honey is essentially regurgitated nectar with enzymes mixed in with the water taken out. Now the fact that the water has been taken out is what gives it its great life because water is sort of the substance that attracts bacteria and things like that. So that's why honey lasts forever is because it's relatively water free. Uh, bees are really great competitors. They're very fast at finding places and exploiting uh, patches. So if you have honeybees in your backyard, you won't see bumblebees because uh, what will happen is the, they'll beat the honeybees to the uh, nectar and basically force them out of that territory. So they outcompete 
basically bumblebees. And they'll chase uh, hummingbirds away as well, other natural predators. So they're very, the, the, the space is pretty much all theirs. Uh, they're very nimble, they're very quick, and, um, and yeah, they... Uh, do the bumblebees themselves, do they have hives too, or what, what are they, are they so solitary insects? Or? Uh, the, no, they have hives. Um, they're not solitary. They don't, they don't actually uh, travel in the numbers that honeybees do, uh, and they don't necessarily live in cavities. I think I've seen that they also can have ground, uh, but I don't, know as, I don't know as much about bumblebees. Yeah. Okay, thank you.